Hello? Ah. Good afternoon. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce this WikiLeaks talk by Julian Assange, uh, an investigative editor, and uh, Daniel uh, Berger, a writer and an analyst. So, if you'll please join me in giving them a warm round of applause, please. Uh, hello, hello, everybody. Um, I hope uh, the audio is okay. So it's good to see that so many people made it to the talk. We're, uh, despite the technical issues we have, we're happy um, to begin now. Um, we've been thinking a while about what to present at this talk for this audience. So um, we will begin by discussing what WikiLeaks actually is about to make sure that everybody here in the audience has an understanding of what this project is aiming at. Um, in the second part, we will explain to you some principles that we have as an underlying theory of why we're actually doing this uh, project. The third part will deal with um, a more advanced view of uh, today's media and uh, censorship in the media. And in the last part, we will be discussing why this project is especially important to everyone who is in this audience here today. So all the people attending this Congress. Um, what is WikiLeaks? Uh, in a nutshell, we can uh, define WikiLeaks as an entity that is publishing information. This information has a certain criteria that it needs to meet, and this criteria is um, described as quoted above. We accept classified, censored, and otherwise restricted material of political, diplomatic, or ethical significance. So. Basically, this means that apart from this criteria, there is no other judgment involved. This is a very important understanding to understand how WikiLeaks operates and also why certain material might be published that for some parts of society seems to be controversial, for example. But it is very important to define a static criteria and not place any judgment on this criteria. So there is no censorship involved or any kind of bias from anyone involved in publishing. Um, the wiki itself or the project uh, operates an anonymous platform that is designed to be uncensorable by anybody in the world trying to censor it. And it is also, which is important, uh, covered by the protection of different laws. A lot of the countries in today's world um, do not have really strong laws for the media anymore. But uh, a few countries, like for instance Belgium, also the United States with the First Amendment, and especially for example Sweden, uh, have very strong laws protecting the media and the work of investigative or general journalists. So from our perspective this is something, if, there's any, if there are any Swedes here, um, you have to make sure that your country is really one of the, the, the strongholds of freedom of information. You have to make sure that this keeps, keeps there, this stays there, that this does not change. While we understand that things like the Pirate Bay may be of more immediate value to everyone here in the audience, this is not, this is not all that Sweden is about. There is a more underlying... <laughs> Please make sure that democratic values do not get undermined by consumption or by risks to potential businesses or things like this. We're talking about something more and much more important here. Um, the second thing, it is a technology that is being used to defeat shortcomings in our societies. So we can perceive that our societies and the legal regulations we have are not really optimal. And we need to f use the technology in a way to address these issues, to route around them, to maneuver around them, and to get to a goal that is the same thing for society and not a, not a subject of some weird regulation. We're enabling free speech and trying to save the fourth estate. We'll be talking about this a little bit more. Um, for who is not familiar, the fourth, fourth estate presents the independent media as a controlling body in a state. Um, we'll be discussing this a little bit more in detail. And it also is a proof of concept. This is also something very important to understand. The, de the development of this platform is not finished and most likely will never be finished. 
And what right now is implemented is a, a test base or a, co a proof of concept that shows that the actual ratio behind the project is working. And in this respect, there's going to be more help needed from a lot of talented people that I assume are also in this audience to further this development and to implement more mechanisms that have been defined as being useful. So um, I'll quickly introduce you to some technical uh, challenges we have within the project. Um, Wikileaks is, after all, uh, driven by a lot of technology. So one of the technical issues we, we're looking at is uh, sanitizing of documents. Um, every document that gets published is in some way cleaned before uh, metadata that can, uh, that can compromise a source who wants to remain anonymous um, is removed from this document. This is a big challenge as we also identify uh, new means of metadata or let's say other concepts on how to get to a source if you're investigating. So this is also a developing process. Um, uh, there are some issues with SSL and trust in general that um, we perceive in our platform. Um, we can say we do not trust, as a principle, we do not trust anyone operating a business that is selling some kind of uh, certificates, for example. Ultimately, um, we believe that each of these businesses can easily be compromised. So. The only certificate we trust is ours, and um, there are some, there's going to be some development for the future where we will address this with um, maybe a, um, we're looking into a customized Tor browser bundle or a live CD that only has our certificate to, ev to avoid being uh, compromised from another entity. Um, there's the, the issue of dot .onion addresses or the Freenet and other similar concepts, um, which we find very useful, but unfortunately not used enough by everyone. So um, these platforms lack the political input still, or the political impact. People are not using it in a way that it, ex it is acceptable for the media to pick up information from dot .onion addresses or to use these to generate more traffic on the Tor network. Um, and there is the general problematic thing that we're running, and this is a slight misconception sometimes, we're running a high availability network, but high availability in a sense of being censorship proof. So it's a different angle from saying that you want to be online for 99.9% .9 of the time. If you want to make sure that nothing that you have online can ever be censored, even if your site goes down for half a day. So you need to implement mechanisms to make sure that you cannot be censored. And these mechanisms don't necessarily perform in the same way as some easy setups with a couple of caches in front and fast lines and easy host hosting. So these are, I think, in a nutshell, the technological aspects of, uh, or a few of the f many technological aspects that we need to take care of. So. Uh, this is a remainder from an old <laughs> slide, actually. Um, we had a hardware crash this morning, so a hard drive crash, and uh, had to rewrite this a little bit. But um, we're going to take this to a next level with other development as well. So there's going to be more intelligent routing for documents, for content on the website, addressing legal issues that we might have in certain countries and similar things. So you want to talk about... Uh, Okay, so uh, only no, I'll no, talk wait. about yeah, no, video. You pulled out the video. Sorry about that. I will talk about uh, some example cases. I am not. In fact, perhaps we should see a show of hands here of of how many people who have gone to uh, WikiLeaks more than ten times. No, no. At the so that looks to be about half the audience. Uh, so for, for the other half of the audience, um, mm -hmm. you may have heard about uh, some of the things we've done in the media, but what you hear about is uh, frequently what is of greatest salacious interest to the Western media and to people in general. Uh, that doesn't tend to be our everyday work. So we'll give you uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, there are many, many thousands of these examples, um, and maybe people can speak to us uh, afterwards. 
Uh, we don't want to exhaust you with uh, all the successful examples which we have. Um, so on, only one month after the Congress uh, last year, uh, we had um, a major legal fight uh, on our hands with a big Swiss bank uh, called Bank Julius Baer that ran a Cayman Islands uh, operation and moved many assets, laundered money essentially, whether you want to say that's illegal or legal, it was certainly laundering money uh, through, the, through the Cayman Islands. Um, that bank was not able to attack our servers physically, but it did find uh, a weak point, which was the domain name register, uh, which was based in California. Uh, it then hired three uh, lawyers uh, who worked for Arnold Schwarzenegger and Celine Dion. Uh, these are classic Hollywood lawyers and uh, sued us in San Francisco. So we still had many alternative domains. So at, at no stage was the service interrupted across the board. But the most well-known address was taken down um, by that domain operator, Dynadot. In, in response, uh, we built a, a legal posse, a legal team of, int of people who were interested in the same cause uh, who came to defend us. So this is a very important lesson that uh, as Indiv isolated individuals, people can achieve almost nothing. But when groups come together in common interests, they can achieve a lot. Uh, and so, oh. <laughs> so the groups that, that did come, uh, and I should, should thank them, um, were the ACLU, the EFF, POGO, Ralph Nader, Citizen.org, 11 media organizations, big media organizations, who saw us as the thin end of the wedge on uh, domain name based uh, censorship attacks. And uh, a couple of uh, professors from universities. Uh, that group of altogether 22 lawyers was able to defeat the Swiss banks group of three lawyers. Now many people say that, well this shows that justice was done in the US system that this was uh, a product of the US justice system, that there was a, a problem, it broke First Amendments, but then it reverted itself. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't revert itself. What happened was, is we outspent a Swiss bank by funding, through our community, 22 lawyers instead of three. So it's very important to remember that justice doesn't just happen. Justice is forced by people coming together and uh, exercising strength, unity, intelli and intelligence. Um, okay. mm. So there's a, another recent uh, example of uh, something that is a bit contentious is the, the privacy issues involved in this project. From, from our perspective, we've dealt with these a lot and, and we're not, and we're not uh, very concerned uh, I shouldn't say we're not concerned, but uh, we have a, an understanding and a lot of experience deal, dealing with these pri privacy issues and a set philosophical position. But for other people, um, there has been concern. So there was even concern in getting this talk on here at the Congress, believe it or not, uh, to do with uh, Sarah Palin. So we released uh, Sarah Palin, the US uh, Republican vice presidential candidates uh, emails. Now, people have said, well, this is her, her personal email. She's a political figure. Uh, and these emails may be of some political relevance, but they are her personal emails. Who's to judge the relevance, the political relevance? If, if it's us who is to judge the political relevance, then are, are we uh, robust enough to, to judge this for all of society? Because in the Sarah Palin case, uh, there were key aspects about 
these emails that she had been using Yahoo instead of her governmental server to hide information from the Freedom of Information Act. This is something that can only be established by careful scrutiny. And this is really that is something for the public to do and the political groups uh, in, the, in the public and not us. Um, uh, another famous example from maybe two months ago is the, the BNP or the, the British National Party. This is a, a, a neo-Nazi uh, party from the UK, uh, a whites-only national socialist in its policies. Um, now, I don't say that to demonise this group, but just to describe it. But it, it is of intense interest to the UK population. And it had a secret membership list which was kept encry encrypted. Um, we released this membership list of about 13,000 members and it included their home addresses, their telephone numbers, the, their party descriptions on what they had done, whether they needed to be concealed because they were police officers. That, that resulted in approximately 2,000 articles in the British press. So that, that, that really changed the political landscape in Great Britain for uh, at least a week or so. And what will happen, <laughs> what, what will happen to the BNP, uh, I don't know. But that group has consist, constituents that are attracted to it for some good reasons. You can say the party itself is a problem, but actually there are reasons that people join parties like this that are not being addressed by the mainstream parties. Um, okay, so anyway, you, you may want to, this, the map that was just displayed there is in fact a density map of uh, the British National Party. Uh, when this was released, many, many people uh, produce secondary reports like the British press, but produce maps like this and how's the video? No time. No time. And there's a great video that you should see if you go to, to YouTube, which is a satire on the BNP. Uh, the, one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Um, okay. And some of you may know that in the past two months, we have had a bit of a dispute uh, with the BND, the, the German secret, uh, Foreign Secret Service. Now, this, this began uh, when we released an IP, uh, a document from T Systems and an IP list describing a BND cover agency called BBOE and its IP address ranges. And simply Googling the addresses on this address range so that they had left trails across the internet. Uh, as an example, modifying uh, Wikipedia's entry on the BND to say that, in fact, they did not use the Goethe Institute as cover. <laughs> uh, so once again, who's to judge the privacy of this information? This, ca this came from T-Systems. This is a telecommunications company. Uh, is it right for that information to be kept private or not? Actually, it's of substantial interest to many groups. Um, and most importantly, it was of interest to whoever the, whoever the whistleblower was in T-Systems. It was of interest to them and important to them, and that's enough for us. Uh, you can read in this month's... What's it called? Datenschleuder. This month's Datenschleuder has gone into more... has taken this information and gone into more depth about the BVOE and what its activities are and the cover that it used. Thanks for that. That's, uh, it was really nice to see that this document was picked up by this community here as well. So that's the way we would like to see more information being processed. So sub subsequent to that, we, we've released a number of BND-related documents and reports. So one of those was on Kosovo, a classified BND document on the... BND's involvement in Kosovo for, uh, in uh, 2005. You may remember Der Spiegel reported on this recently. There was a big, a big scandal in the German press. Um, the head of the BND, Ernst Ulla, uh, wrote to us threatening to criminally prosecute us unless we removed that uh, unless we removed some unspecified BND document. And we asked, well, Ernst, tell us more. 
what document are you talking about? There are many. Uh, and Ernst, Ernst's response was, well, actually, it's this document about Kosovo, but while you're at it, <laughs> remove everything. Otherwise, we'll criminally prosecute you, and we've already briefed BND lawyers to look into how to do that. Um, now, for the head of a, a secret intelligence service, this, I, I was gobsmacked by the level of incompetence in, in sending a, a journalistic organization a threat like this. Uh, and you can, you, can even, uh, you can even see that, perhaps you should speak. Yeah, well, um, it was kind of funny. We received this email on the 18th of December. And uh, when looking at the email, we noticed that there was a different date in the email body, which was the 6th of December. So we had a look at the header that was, um, and we recognized it was forwarded. And then it turned out that the first mail address they had sent it to was the WikiLeaks at jabber.se address, which is a Jabber address we use. And it took them about two days to realize that even though <laughs> I mean, and, and we, we tried to reverse engineer what, what was the thinking in sending it to the Jabber address. Yeah, so it, it was the only copy and pasteable address on the contact page. The uh, it, other email address. <laughs> all the others are, are yeah. gifts, so we don't get spam. <laughs> so it's kind of hilarious. Somehow, I mean, so much for the competence and maybe the thoroughness with what. Um, with how you look at things before you start to react or overreact or do something really stupid. So my impression is that Ernst was a former po uh, police officer before he became head of BND. So he probably saw the WikiLeaks German address and assumed that we were a German operation, uh, didn't understand the recent developments uh, on internet media and thought there is a German, op German operation that is defying me I am a former policeman, let's use the criminal law. And straight away without any thinking, and this is really not someone you want to be the head of a foreign intelligence service. You want someone with uh, subtlety. Uh, I, I can't understand, I feel sorry for Germany, actually. <laughs> These are, are more notorious, especially for those examples are more notorious, especially for this audience, and why the Bank Julius Baer case was, was quite uh, serious. There's a, a lot of things we do routinely that are very serious, uh, but still get little attention. And uh, as an example, we have released many, many, we have exposed many, many political assassinations. Uh, some of which have received media coverage uh, in their own country. But as an example, we released uh, only three months ago a very important report on Kenya uh, by the Kenyan Human Rights Commission, that had, which is a government human rights commission, it's an extremely credible organization, uh, documenting 500 extrajudicial assassinations that had occurred in the past 18 months. The Kenyan Human Rights Commission had submitted this to uh, the United Nations uh, Commission Against Torture and was, was trying to get the International Criminal Court involved. Not released to the Kenyan public because politically it is too difficult for the Human Rights Commission in Kenya to be able to release that sort of information publicly and also this report named names. Um, there was some pickup in, in the Kenyan press, but the rest of the world, nothing. I mean, we had this on our front page for uh, almost a week. The rest of the world, nothing. So the, getting leaked documents out is extremely important, but it is not the only thing. Um, sometimes there's no interest group to care to spread the information, and that is a, a case in Kenya. I'm not sure what to do about that. Uh, how do you get people to care about a, a serious matter that involves someone else? It's, it's hard to say. I don't know what the answer is. So uh, basically, to make this short introduction on the leaks or leaked documents we have short, um, all documents that we have are real. It's hard fact that is documented. 
And all these documents reflect some facets of something that is happening at some point in time somewhere in the world. And this is reality. So the few very disturbing pictures we just had here are all pictures that have been leaked to us from Tibet or from or protests in China by Tibetan people, from uh, protests that we had seen in Kenya. So th these documents are suppressed from the media. These documents pertain to violence that is caused by truth being told, by documents surfacing to the society. So it is important to understand that this is not a hypothetical construct, some project that is doing something very obscure. But we're actually dealing with information that reflects a very important facet of lives all over the world and that has an influence on the quality, the freedom, and all other aspects of lives of people on this planet, living beings that we all need to have feelings for and compassion for and care for. This is very important in the mission that we try to bring across. Um, <clears throat> in, in that respect, we need to talk about some basic principle to understand why this is all of importance. Um, everyone here is what he knows. You can only judge your reality and take any sane decision on how you shape your future if you have all the hard facts to properly assess your situation, to make a sound judgment. In that respect, we, uh, as a very simplified model, we have abstracted the process of how perception actually works onto five things. So uh, you have reality, and then there's a certain observation of this reality, which um, you uh, somehow uh, in your brain process, and then you can take an action on it, and this action then again will influence your reality again. So this is kind of a circle that you are that every information is being processed in. If you now map this on certain players in this game, or you take these rules to their players, then you have the people in this world, which is everyone here and everybody else. And then you have the sources who observe certain things and who feel that there is a need to talk about the things that they observe. And these sources communicate what they find to journalists. And the journalists actually process this information and do their investigation, have a look what is relevant with this, um, who does it impact, who does it pertain to. And then you, the action comes in, and the action is the distribution of this information, and also the mass cognition. So this is the part where what a journalist does hits everyone in this room here, and where everyone here who is blogging, for example, decides what actually happened that is so important for me to now reproduce what I just read or engage into my own analysis of what I just read. And this is where everyone here or everyone else going, uh, doing some media work or processing this information is actually judging on what is going to become part of the future. Everyone here who is running a blog is taking a part of this decision. What will actually matter tomorrow? If we're just talking about, I don't know, WikiLeaks being down again or being overloaded or some new gimmick that is being shown or some new game that has come out or whatever, or if we judge or talk about some real information, something that affects people's lives some other place in the world. The same way you decide, do I just copy and paste or do I actually read a source document? So it is very important to understand this decision and to understand what the impact on reality of this single everyday decision is. And uh, looking from this, uh, we can say that uh, as a portal or as this, uh, this project, we can perceive these players in the game uh, from a certain angle that we can take. So we have a slice that we can look at which shows, first of all, what are sources or whistleblowers motivated by? So who is working in what corporation, what government, what institute or whatever environment who feels that there is something going on which is secret, which has not been talked about, but which needs to be taken to you, to the public? 
then we can see what the media of this actually picks up. So the media as a pre-selecting entity is taking a decision on what they want to report about, what is commercially uh, relevant to talk about, and we can see who is taking action about, against this reportage, who is trying to censor it, who is trying to keep it away from the media or trying to sue them about it. And we can perceive how much of this is being picked up by you and what your actual interest is. So if the media might be reporting on something but nobody else cares about it. Or if you are interested in things, we see a lot of Google News searches coming in from referrers or something, but there actually is no media pickup for material that you are looking for. So we have a very important, uh, a very important view on what actually is relevant to certain groups of this society. And this is where we can act on and where we have uh, the possibility now to address these issues or to optimize this. And in that respect, um, we can see what happens and we can do something about it. Um, we can see that there is a current, and we will talk about this in the next part in a little more in detail, there is a complete eradication of certain parts of history going on. There's, uh, this is much easier than anyone in this crowd here most likely will think. Uh, we can see that censorship is being in implemented systematically and globally on a technical level, on a political level, on a societal level, so that everyone here either doesn't even know about it or accepts it because it's part of becoming part of this game. And we can, from this, develop counter strategies to these problems which is we can enable whistleblowers to safely communicate their issues without fearing repression from a state or a company or whoever with a power over other people. And we can make sure that we have some proactive anti-censorship uh, environment that we can offer to, these, to the media. So we can offer legal backings to all the journalists that need to fear now going into lawsuits against others that need to fear having their maybe small newspaper shut down over a lawsuit they can't pay, that can't pick up all of the material they maybe want to pick up just because there's too much, there's a too big power group behind protecting some secret or behind protecting critical information. And in the same way we can do this in a very cost effective manner because we are just processing this, we're not asking for any money, we're giving it to whoever wants to report about it. So as a very easy example, if you're a journalist somewhere, you don't have to have a source sitting in Guantanamo Bay to give you access to a first-rate source document. You can get the Guantanamo Bay manuals right from our website and you can then read them and process your own story on them. You don't have to copy and paste the DPA or AP press agency's uh, press release, you can read it and find what they have not found because they don't have too much time for it or because they're not interested in it. You can make your own opinion and you can bring your opinion in into a global discussion about a certain topic. And that is actually one of the things we're trying to address. Um, also, we have an, an increased perception. Uh, sorry. So, an increased perception that is coming out of this is giving you and us and everybody else a new perception or a new perspective on reality. We can perceive new things and new aspects of all of this. Um, okay. So, many people. Uh, say on the internet that this is a great a boon for censorship resistance and freedom information. And in some ways they're right, but in other ways this is absolutely not the truth. And it's extremely dangerous to believe that this is the truth. You know, uh, George Orwell said that he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. And this is never more true than with electronic archives. Once a newspaper was printed and distributed to libraries everywhere, even now when newspapers are printed and distributed to libraries everywhere, no one actually goes to the library to read them. They trust 
the electronic archive. And the electronic archive of most major newspapers is not trustable, and the same goes with every other organization. We have seen many, many examples of major newspapers such as The Guardian or The Telegraph pull material from their archives permanently, material that has been published. So, for an example, this year uh, there were seven stories removed from The Guardian, The Telegraph and The New Statesman in response to fear over legal costs. Those stories, six of those stories, had been published over five years ago. If you go to the URLs for those stories, you won't see that this story has been removed by legal action or the fear of legal costs. You will see not found. And if you search for the indexes of those newspapers, you will see not found. Those stories not only have ceased to exist, they have ceased to have ever existed. Uh, so the centralization that is occurring in archive repository means that the censorship is very easy. Censorship, fire, cens cens censorship firewalls like the Great Firewall of China and ones uh, in, that are now sweeping throughout Europe uh, under the basis that they'll combat child porn, but which once established can be used for anything, um, provide proactive censorship. And that's something that's never really been done before in terms of newspapers. This d degree of proactive censorship, once something has been published, censoring it uh, globally, immediately, so people don't know that the information e even existed. Um, and of course, there's all the, the usual, the other kinds of censorship which people talk about more in Western societies, which is economic censorship or uh, wanting to uh, have the approval of someone like Rupert Murdoch, uh, their newspaper boss. Uh, so, so uh, in the last week, we have released the the Thai censorship list, uh, about 1,500 sites in the past year that have been censored. The, the Thai censorship list, uh, electronic censorship list um, mechanism, came in originally to defeat child pornography. In the past year, 1,203 web pages that have been censored by the government, all of them state that the reason was Le Majeste, which is criticism of the king. There have been none in the past year that were censored under the basis of child pornography, even though that's why the censorship system was introduced. The same, Denmark has a, a system, Sweden has, even has a system, Switzerland has a system, UK has a system, Australia is about to introduce a system. The core mechanisms for censorship are sweeping across the world right now. And Western societies may well end up like Thailand if everyone is not really careful. Uh, so, in, in the, the fourth estate, as a mechanism to control national states, uh, is also crumbling. So, in the past year, there have been 12,000 12, journalists have lost their jobs. 50 years, ago, 50 years ago, there were approximately 50 multinational media companies. Now, there are approximately five. And Rupert Murdoch says that in the next few years, there will be about three global media players. When you have a global media player, you have a centralization point that can be censored extremely easily. Um, and that's ignoring the sort of economic censorship and uh, unity of political opinion that occurs in a global media uh, giant. So this is a re remarkable and disturbing statistic that there are now 40 investigative journalists left in the entire United States working for newspapers. The New York Times has the most, it has 10. Okay, so what, what about uh, blogs? Uh, are, are blogs the antidote 
Absolutely not. They could be the antidote, but there's some key factors that mean that they're not, that mean that in practice uh, they don't do what they should be doing. So we've seen many examples of blog hosting sites pulling down blogs, blog authors pulling down sites. As individuals, they're not strong enough to withstand censorship attempts. Also, the, the spectrum of new information that has been delivered has not actually increased as a result of blogs. It has actually decreased because most blogs take material that's printed in AP or printed in the New York Times, original research, and just cut and paste it and say, I agree, or my cat disagrees. I mean, it's, it's just, a, it's a, from the point of view of a journalist, it's appalling. Um, and blogs are doing the same thing, possibly for the same reason that small town newspapers are doing. That is, they, small town newspapers news, use news wires instead of writing stuff themselves, so they can sell their newspaper and classified ads. Blogs are doing it so they can sell the reputation of the person with minimal effort, so they can now also sell ads with minimal effort. But they're not actually contributing anything original to the world other than saying what their position is. That's a kind of important thing. It's sort of like a polling to understand what the, the populace is general view is. But you have to have the original source information for civilization to work on. If, the, if, there's, if you don't have original source information, then everyone is just talking to themselves in a circular manner. And so blogs uh, could be a, a great solution to fourth estate guided civilization, but in practice they're not. So UK libel tourism. This is uh, we'll just cover this very, very briefly. Um, the, the United Kingdom law courts are used by oligarchs and kleptocrats all over the world to sue other people all over the world, not in the United Kingdom. So uh, an example we've dealt with recently is uh, Nahadimi Orchi, who's an Iraqi billionaire. He's tried to sue us, he's tried to sue the New Statesman. If you go to the New Statesman now, you'll see on their front page a huge apology to Nahadimi Orchi uh, because they're scared of uh, prospective legal costs. We managed to get this raised in the UK Parliament uh, one week ago with three cross-party MPs, and one of those MPs, Dennis McShane, uh, said that UK courts had become effectively a Soviet organ of censorship. Uh, that's how serious, that's how bad the situation is in the UK. Um, in the United States, laws are being passed to prevent UK judgments being enforced in the US because it's so bad. Um, we should skip this to yes. the question. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we had to skip some slides. I hope that was not too inconvenient. Um, with... Uh, Okay, thanks a lot, Jake. So uh, after the talk, you can give Jake Applebaum um, a big hand. He just gave us some few more minutes. Um, okay, so basically, one of the reasons now that we have uh, talked about, uh, let's say, what we're doing and uh, how this is affecting maybe reality and the way that news are processed, we need to talk a little bit about why this is relevant to everyone in this audience and. Uh, everyone here at this Congress and maybe people that are streaming in. So wh whoever you look at, uh, every citizen of any society needs to take, take action in the society or needs to become part of those that do something about the current state of events. So you will have to involve to actually help change something. It does not help to reproduce somebody else saying that this is no good and then think I have done something about it because I have reproduced this opinion somewhere. This is actually just desensitizing everybody. You will have, see this on a thousand pages. Everybody says the same thing and then you don't think about it anymore. Also, over time, you will all be affected at an increasing level. 
Um, there's a lot of levels where censorship or restricting information takes place that you are not aware of. You might see the technical perspective. You are aware if there's a new filter at your ISP or something. But you don't know about British uh, uh, libel law that is just suing the information from existence. So you need to be aware of more facets of this whole complex topic. Um, so the involvement that you can decide for is pretty diverse. Um, it is very important that you stay curious and that you start acting on it, that you talk to others, that you report on it, that you actually do something active about it. Um, there's a term that we from time to time use is that uh, the people involved with our project have all decided to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. So you might maybe wouldn't believe how many people have volunteered for helping with this project but then you explain to them what they can help with and they never come back again there's a very short um, a very small initial motivation and that ceases to exist after a few while so you need to train yourselves to stick in with the things even though it might be boring or even though you don't see an immediate effect you you need to work towards a long-term goal and um, everybody here is happily welcome to join us in the cause we have um, but we'll get to this in, a, in one slide so we know that this audience here has a big potential and we know that almost anyone here who is involved in technology has uh, a way or um, the means to help shape the future you are the people who are implementing and securing the systems that we have today. It, at the end of the day, it will m maybe be someone from this audience who is implementing a censorship list or who has access to the censorship list or who in, other, in another way is aware of what is going on on the technological side, who can creatively help shape the future in a certain way. A lot of things for the platform needed to be developed as well. People with creative minds need to give their input on finding solutions for problems we see. Um, another important aspect, no matter what people here tell you, there is no real value in selling out to the industry. Um, we know that in the recent years this has been uh, advertised more and more and uh, you write exploit codes for companies that sell them to the governments or whatever. Um, you do a lot of contractual work for someone. Um, in the end of the day, this always suits someone who is making money with this. But it does not mean, and I think even looking at the financial crisis of the last weeks or months, we know that making money is not necessarily connected to the benefit of the people. So you need to be aware that if you're serving someone's business needs, you're not necessarily helping to develop the society in the same way. In the same way. Um, challenge your reality. Everyone here is very critical about technology you use, software you use, other things you play along with, that you hack, that you modify, that you change. Develop the same attitude towards your reality. Look at how things are working and be as critical as you are on the technical things about your society and about your community, about the information you, you get and about how this information is processed by the media. And as a maybe last point that is very important for us to make, a lot of people focu focus on too much un undocumented conspiracy. We have tens of thousands of documents that give hard fact about conspiracies in this world, real world conspiracies with conspirators and people that try to manipulate and hide things from you. There's too many people focusing on all the things that are hypothetically out there. Start reading the things that are already there and from there we can take it to the next things. Encourage other sources by processing source material. Encourage other sources to step forward and give more information out that you will read and bring back to the community that will become part of the truth that is being told. So in that way help to take technology to change tomorrow by preserving today and yesterday. This is a very, as uh, Julian outlined before, a very important part of 
the actual work is preserving yesterday and today and all the information that had already been there, preserving this for the future so people are able to take a sane decision. So in that way, um, we would uh, like you to help us or we would ask anyone who feels that this is a good cause and that feels that he has some time on his hands or other ways to contribute to help um, further our development and to help uh, make this portal more workable for more people in the world. We only depend on awareness and involvement and both of these things can be spawned from people getting involved into the project and spawning more attention to it. So we are made of many things and you need to realize that you have a lot of potential and not fear your potential. There was a very hypothetical threat that there might be people showing up today interrupting this talk and we spend all of the night thinking about how we should act on this. Should we come here? Should we delay this talk? To, should we stream the talk from, I don't know, some remote place into here? But actually there is nothing to hide for. We are not we are standing here for telling, talking about a project that is important and the project that is on a moral cause that is good, that is protected by a lot of laws. There is no need to fear. The only thing you need to fear is your fear. So get over this and stand up for what you believe in and act accordingly. This is. In that respect, donate time, whatever time you have for whatever things to do. Uh, we can you need housing, hosting, bandwidth, uplinks, storage, development time, a lot of things that I, we're all pretty sure that this audience can deliver in mass. And if you understand the value of this project, then please get in touch with us. So in that respect, um, I guess I'm not sure if you want to give the la if you want to give the last things to our helping hands or That's all right. No, so uh it's just a, a very few thank yous. Uh, Jake has been immensely patient, I believe. Um <laughs> yeah, So none of what we are do we do is possible without sources. Those are those people in different organizations, activists, friends of journalists, people working for government bureaucracies, people like people working for government bureaucracies, people like you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> people work uh, that have have come forward that, that have leaked information to us. An important, a very important statistic, and one that surprised us, is that we have never, we have never, to our knowledge, and we try very hard to know, lost a source, ever. We have never had a source exposed. We have never had a source prosecuted. We, we, ex we expected to have sources prosecuted, not because of technical failures on our end, not because we didn't protect them, but because investigations based on means, motive and opportunity inside an organisation are not something we can really do much about. And yet no source has been caught. So what, what this actually shows you is that the perception of fear is not in tune with the reality for sources. The perception that they will get caught is vastly in excess of the chance that they will actually get caught. And this is a, a selection problem, a sampling problem, in that it's only when people get caught that you actually hear about it. When people are successful, you either don't hear anything about this in the mainstream press, or you might hear, you might see something, documents seen by the New York Times, but you don't think of a particular person when that happens. So our, our legal team, uh, we thanked them before, but they are immensely useful and uh, over a million dollars worth of legal time denoted to this project. It's 
extremely significant. Uh, and the Tor project and, and Roger uh, and Jake, these are people who walk the walk as well as talking the talk. And one of the ways you can help us is to help them. Yeah, make excellent notes, everybody. There's, don't fear it, just do it. And it would, have, would be of immense help to a lot of projects that try to do something useful in this world. And uh, PRQ, who have really a Swedish uh, internet hosting provider, who have really gone into bat for us. There, there are others. Uh, PRQ is the most notable. Um, and uh, a classic example is when we released inf information on the Northern Rock Bank. We, we did this uh, last year, long before the financial collapse, we released uh, injuncted information in the UK and uh, they, the lawyers shillings called uh, PRQ and uh, I, I won't uh, say the expletive but um, you know uh, call them ambulance chasers and they should go away. Uh, actually a very effective tactic when they try and report that back to their client. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, finally, I guess some other helping hands. Um, there's a lot of people involved in this project, much more than you can see on this stage here right now. Um, they all know about it uh, for various reasons. We can't name them. Um, I guess everybody will understand, but uh, they hopefully all know who they are and what it is that they contribute. So in this respect, uh, if any of this sounds appealing to you, um, be that from a technological side, be that because we offer legal challenges you won't get with any other clients, or be that for whatever reason or whatever value you see in freedom of information. So get in touch with us, us and uh, thanks a lot for um, the patience. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, I'd just like to end on uh, a quote by the American revolutionary uh, Thomas Paine, who wrote a book uh, called The Rights of Man. He's a very famous figure uh, in the American Revolution. And Thomas Paine warned that if the majority of the people uh, were denied the truth and the ideas of truth, that it was time to storm what he called uh, the Bastille of words. And uh, we think that time is now and that it we can do it and with the help of this audience and this community uh, we can do it. To, to get in contact uh, with us uh, you can look at the web page, there's uh, lots of contact details there for different countries. Um, also we'll be around uh, yes. here afterwards. Yeah, well, at least after Jake's talk, which we would like to recommend to everybody, just be seated and prepare for the next good talk, I guess. And so, thanks a lot. It will be a very, very good talk, so do stay around. <laughs>